Good morning, Mrs. Wallaroo. And how are you? Ah, and on the, the other side of the mother, behind the tea tree scrub, if you look really carefully, you can just see the silhouette of her son. A little black wallaroo. Just put his head down to have a, a bite of grass. She's putting up with me. Approaching quite well. There she goes. And considering the way I'm dressed, she's doing quite well in the not being alarmed stakes. Because I am about to take the Tebco Discovery out to play in the traffic. This fine but overcast Saturday morning. I always think this thing kind of looks like E.T. As those of you who've been watching the channel for a while will already realise, the aim of the game is eventually to run from my hut all the way in to Glen Innes, which is roughly 16 kilometres away and then go on another five kilometres to where my mother lives on the electric bicycle powered by solar recharge so I've been thus far testing the bike on the driveway and Yarraford Road basically running from my hut down to Barilda driveway to the Brilda Gate on the Yarraford Road, running down here to the highway, up here to the railway line, going about a 200 yards or so past the railway line and turning around in that driveway. And thus far, three days ago, I completed a dummy run to town in the sense that I went from my place to the highway up to the turnaround at the railway back to the highway and then back up to the hut and that's 15.9 kilometers 16 k's to town did all that on one battery and you can see 16 kilometres, and that's what a vertical transect of the dummy run to town looks like. Today I've got a different trick in mind. What I propose to do is run from here halfway to town and then come along back, which on the map looks like here to here and then down here and go a little bit past Whitmore Road and turn around on top of that little hill there. And you can see by the contour, the road's on top of a hill. And then come along back and duck in here, have a little bit of look at Yarraford South Picnic Reserve, cross the dreaded bridge again, duck in here, have a little bit of a look at Yarraford North Picnic Reserve and then ideally come back and stop again at the upside down tree or a little bit past it about the point where I have to get off and walk um, the 1100 metre contour I guess so that is the grand plan Again, those of you who've been paying attention to this little saga will remember that I have previously tested all four batteries by rolling and pedalling in manual and not actually using the electric motor until I get down to the Barilda gate and then turbo mode riding as fast as the push bike will go back up until I get to the point where I was pretty much the upside down tree where you have to stop pedaling. 
which was how I came to the conclusion that the motor is 96.8% efficient based on a couple of assumptions and how much power it takes to recharge the batteries with uh, these lines coming down here being the amount of uh, watts going into the inverter to feed the battery charger and these lines here being the accumulated charge in the battery before the charger says that it's full. And here in pink you can see the accumulated charge versus the what's going into the charger and that's the recharge on battery number one after 15.9 kilometers which works out to 301 watt hours assuming 5% inefficiency of the battery charger that's 286.7 watt hours to recharge which means I used 81.9% of the 350 watt hour battery and I think for longevity of battery life that's probably about as much as I should be taking out of them in one hit before recharging. So, according to the theory, I should be able to go all the way to town and because of this great big long downhill stretch, I probably should be able to ride around in town on one battery and then change to a second battery for the trip home or change to a second battery for the trip out to the old girl's place and back to town and yeah, I don't know maybe the top of that hill on the way home I would change to a third battery if I've been all the way to the old girl's but yeah 16 kilometers on one battery in this uppy downy hilly New Englandy country is kind of what I'm thinking might be the go so isn't it a good thing that I've got four batteries, all told, because I hope to be one day able to pull a trailer full of groceries back from town. Okay. Thus, the, the paperwork, preparations, and pre-planning for a little bit of e-bike test piloting. And because this is an evolving saga, today we have a new feature. And that being that I've decided to make myself just a little bit more visible. I mean, yeah, this is great for me. And when I'm on the road, I'm wearing my bright fluorescent, not quite luminous, green Tremor brand skid lid. Or gyro brand Tremor model skid lid whereas from the side it has a bright silvery reflector around the tire as well as an orange reflector on the spokes it's got white markings that kind of reflect back the pannier bags have got highly reflective ROS I don't know what that's supposed to indicate they've got hot glow-in-the-dark reflective stitching um, that little strip down there that's highly reflective glow in the dark but from the back it's quite the stealth bike black on black on black on black with a little bit of maroon dark maroon it doesn't stick out well if you were to wear camouflage and take the lights off it would be hard for people to spot you at all totally fortuitous that's just how it come from the factory. It was the only discovery they had in the shop on the day that I was buying. I got a stealth bike. I don't want it to be a stealth bike. What's the likelihood of somebody on the highway who's not expecting a bicycle to notice that little hundred dollar cat eye with the bottom bar solid red light and the top bar strobing red light? Maybe they'll see me orange vest with its yellow stripe on it? Maybe not. Wouldn't it be nice if there was something bright, bright reflective road sign yellow?
something with a bit more of an attention seeking look at me factor which will stick out even in the shade something nice and simple made out of offcuts from a homemade ultralight propeller pop riveted to the jigsaw and road sign and stuck in the elasticated rear pocket 20 square inches on either side in the form of an arrow pointing people to go around from driver's head height I think that's going to make an improvement they don't weigh nothing but they don't weigh very much and I can't see how they're going to hurt anything they increase the colour contrast and if you shine a light on them they shine it right back at you and one more factor to add to the fun there has been 20 millimeters of rain on the driveway since i went out there and did the 15.9 kilometer dummy run along yarraford road so hopefully the discovery won't spit me off on the greasy muddy driveway and hopefully i won't finish up as a hood ornament on somebody's car or truck or bus while playing with the traffic or playing in the traffic on the highway and i have gone to great pains to try and get this mounting on the chest to do its job and not sentence you to watching nothing but the instrument panel on the push bike hopefully it'll show you the landscape today um, we shall see I, I went to the trouble of riding around the clearing driveway taxi track whatever you want to call it just to do a, a one minute test video and I'll probably post the test video it's just to show that I did try even if this effort doesn't work and I'm hoping this effort will work I'll set the front strobe to just blink and the back to have a solid and a flasher let's hope that thing is hooked up right who's looking at me sit just on the edge of the tree line where you find them difficult to see mother and son ah oh, I really do enjoy wildlife encounters okay so that is the camera get up there kickstand that's the camera mounting position and I don't know whether that's going to show you the keyboard or not right off we go A lot easier to go down than it is to go up this driveway. Very easy to pick up too much speed though. And there we go, a bit of a soggy patch on the grass. And there, this is my first trip on a wet road. Ah, the sheep have been shorn. It's a funny thing. The town of Glen Innes has about 8,900 people or 8,700 people. When I was a kid, the town plus the shire had 10,000 between them. Glen Innes was 5,998 and the Shire was 4,000. And it was like that 
almost what I would. But as the old people have been growing older and dying and lots of young people have been leaving, there's, there's been a population decline. And it has been my conceit to suggest that one of the reasons Glen Innes in particular, not so much with Armadale, but definitely Glen Innes, say Gyra, Tenterfield, the north end of the New England Tablelands. The reason it appears so unspoilt, even though the population of the earth has nearly tripled in my lifetime, I mean, I can remember when I was writing bad poetry in high school about the Third World War and there was about 3.4 billion people on the planet. Now there's nearly 8 billion. But up here, everywhere else has doubled their population density and it stayed the same and then it slightly tapered off. It's now starting to increase as global warming refugees from the flooding at the coast and the storms at the coast are starting to inflate the local real estate market. None of the locals, unless they've got a very secure job, can afford to rent because they're being outbid. None of the locals can afford to buy a house because the prices are going up. But I never really understood the reason why there weren't more people here and why the population up here never ever grew in the way that it did north, south, east and west of here. But recently I got a book called Surviving New England. And it's written by a bloke who comes from down around Urala. And it's fairly heavily focused on the southern half of New England. All the accounts are of the southern half of New England, but all the early population figures are on the, the whole of the New England tableland. So from about Urala in the south to Tenterfield in the north, and halfway between Glen Innes and Inverell, and halfway between Glen Innes and Grafton. And in 1832, there were no white people, and there were 1,200 to 1,500 Aboriginals. Autochthons, A-U-T-O-C-H-O-N-S, which means the people of the land anywhere on earth. So, no white fellas, one and a half thousand Aborigines in the whole of the New England. So, up here in the northern half of, of that, let's say there'd be six or seven hundred. Well, nine years later, in 1842, there were only 600 Aborigines, 700 maybe. And there were 2,000 white fellas. And there were 10 sheep or cattle per square kilometre. It took nine years to completely destroy the Aboriginal way of life and replace it with the sheep and potato brigade. And they didn't understand how the landscape worked. They didn't realise that the Aboriginal method of land management consisted on maintaining maximum productivity sustainably. The Aboriginal idea of sustainability was that every 200 years there's a 10 year drought if you've got a sustainable number of people living on the land 
and at the end of the 10 year drought nobody has died of thirst or hunger and the land is still in suitable condition to rebound bounce back when it finally rains and project DNA Nation established that 40,000 years ago there was a wave of in-migration <coughs> took a thousand years to cover the country with people and then everybody stayed where they were two ice ages came and went and the Aborigines stayed on their lands and then Captain Cook showed up And he went home and told the British how to get here. And they did. They showed up and they didn't understand that the light, fluffy, aerated spongy topsoil work just like it says, a sponge what it did was soak up the rain, hold it in the soil the inland rivers flowed between levee banks that had the water level higher than that on the surrounding plain so the river actually distributed the water to the inland plain rather than draining it from them but according to the dominant paradigm of the Europeans that means landless ignorant peasant from Europe comes according to their dominant paradigm white people were the finest flower of God's creation and whatever you did in Europe was what you had to do all over the rest of the world so they tried to stock sheep here in Oz at the same level that they were running them in Europe and the heavy sheep with their hard footed hooves compressed the light fluffy topsoil and put a crust on top of it and then next time it rained the water did not soak in it pooled and then the pools joined up and they sheeted and the sheets run off downhill and they cut into the soil so one of the first things the sheep did was commence to erode the landscape another one of the things the sheep did 31 k's 20% 40% power rolling down the hill another thing the sheep did was they selectively graze everything that people eat it's only after they've eaten all the human feed plants that the sheep go on to have a crack at everything that the prey animals used to eat So I always believed, and those figures from surviving New England seem to bear it out, within five years of a sheep walking the land, the local free-range Aborigines were pretty much extinct. They'd either been shot out, poisoned out, 
run away from the horrors. They died of the diseases or they were employed working for rations by whoever had taken over their ancestral homelands and they considered themselves to be lucky still to be on their country. All happened very fast. And with the passing of the free range Aborigines, suddenly the country wasn't being burnt properly it was being eroded and overgrazed and it all fell to pieces really, really, really fast. Still have to keep adjusting that mirror. Yarraford North Picnic Reserve off to the right hand side. Don't know how much, I suppose, turning my head with my hands on the handlebars and keeping the bike going in a straight line, it doesn't turn the camera at all, does it? Got a solar panel on the roof, eh? Sun foils are spreading. I think there's about 50 of them getting around Glen Innes now. Only one on my son's car, two on his truck, one on Howard Eastwood's car, although he's sold it with the sun foil, got a really good price for the car. So anyway, then the usual boom and bust cycle set in with the sheep farmers and the cow farmers. Basically they do exactly what all the big religions have been forbidding for 5,000 years. First it was Ahura Mazda, the god theory of Zoroaster, who prohibited usury. Then it was Deuteronomy talking about the Jewish god. Thou shalt not commit usury. You cannot charge interest to your brother. Then Jesus come along. He was a harsh preacher. He told the Jews they had to get back to the Ten Commandments and Deuteronomy's prohibition against usury. So he threw the moneylenders out of the temple. But the Jewish theologians, they'd come up with a loophole. And their loophole suggested that it was okay giving interest-free loans to other Jews because they were their brothers. But surely the Gentiles, the Goyim, the not-Jews, was fair game to charge interest on them. So for the first 600 years after the crucifixion, the reason the Christians hated the Jews was as much in contempt for their flouting the Deuteronomy prohibition against usury as it was for getting the Romans to kill Jesus. <coughs> and at the 600 year mark, a fella called Muhammad showed up and his teaching was that, surprise, surprise, Allah forbids usury. Because 
if you borrow money to buy land, buy the tools to clear the land, so sun foil on that car too. Work your ass off. Try to repay the loan in seven years by giving eight or maybe nine harvests worth of money back to the person who lent you the money. So the land gets no fallow. Productivity drops. You lose topsoil, you lose soil moisture, you lose organic matter. If you get a drought, or a stormy season, anywhere in that, you miss a year's payment. Surprise, surprise, the money lender forecloses on the mort gauge, M-O-R-T-G-U-A-G-E, mort meaning death and gauge meaning measurement. The money lender with his death measure, who's figured out in advance how much money the borrower can repay before they die of old age. They repossess the farm. The borrower loses years of their life, all their work. Their kids have nothing. And the money lender then leaves the place for six months or a year, lets it get covered in weeds so it looks nice and green, and then they sell the bloody thing to some ill-informed, optimistic, hopeful youngster, and the whole process repeats. And the land never gets fallow periods except when it's between someone who's lost the farm and someone who's buying the farm. Welcome to the Rumble Strip. All that new road back there used to be as narrow as this or worse. Hopefully they will fix this bit sometime soon. All for the convenience of me. To make it easier for me to ride to town without having to go out there onto the main carriageway. Here we see it, as it was forecast, within the map reading, Whitmore Road. Bloody rumble strip. All you gotta do is look in the mirror and you're onto the bastard. Okay. Nothing coming from behind. Off we go back. And that gap in the trees on the hills that you just saw were coming past that sign. On the other side of that is my boundary fence. And the gap in the trees is caused by the 132,000 volt power line that runs over my place. Yeah, I hope they fix this bit of the road.
So yeah, there are longer hills than the one on Yarraford Road, but they're not as steep as it. Coming up here, I don't think I got much below 20 k's, 22 k's. We're nine k's in and we're still on three bars of battery, cruising on 27, rolling with no power. On the other hand, a bit of wind, 40% power, 28.7. Uh, between the wind resistance of sitting almost straight up, the short gearing that means you can't pedal much harder than 26, 28 k's, and the computer that refuses to let the engine have any power if you're doing any faster than about 27. It's very much not a fast bike. But it can put as much work in as I can and it can do it for longer. That means I really only have to work for about one third of the ride, the uphill third. On the downhill third, I don't do much work. Going along the flat, I do almost, almost no work. And of course, When I put the uh, trailer on and fill it with groceries, I'll probably use one battery to go to town and three batteries to come home. So, as I was saying, the land gets progressively flogged and a successive bunch of optimistic agriculturalists gets worked to death and the money lenders get rich collecting interest, which was apparently why the God theory forbid the charging of interest or the paying of interest. And I suspect the theory is that if nobody was charging interest, then nobody would lend money unless it was to some really, really worthy cause where they really didn't care whether they got the money back or not because they had enough money to be able to afford to lend it in the first place. Nobody would be lending money in the hope of forcing somebody to repay more than they lent so that they could then live off the interest. Sit down and let the money earn, money earn, money earn, money by somebody else going broke and flogging the land. And if that showed up in the first monotheistic religions in Europe 5,000 years ago, <coughs> that would be only 1,000 years after the Yamnayans appeared between the Caucasus Mountains on the steppes beside the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and the Yamnayans were the horse milk drinking tall warlike people who were forced by their horses to constantly expand looking for new pasture because if you own a horse, you have a horse on your land, you are living in a drought. Look at that, motorcycle and a sidecar, don't often see them. He waved back too. Probably doesn't often see geriatrics on e-bikes.
And my theory is the Yam names that only took a thousand years to conquer the whole of Europe and Asia, Eurasian continent. I reckon they were descended from the diaspora which followed the abandonment of Gobekli Tepe 11,300 years ago. Okay. Yarraford South. This is called at this stage the Beardy Waters. Although it is actually the Severn River. I have both fished and sailed small model boats here as a child. It has been a bit of a long standing, never realised ambition to get up here with a rail, a sailboat or a rowboat or some form of a boat to muck around with, but you'd have to be burning petrol to get it here and there's no actual real serious reason for doing it. You can, you can justify having a boat to play around with if you live at the coast or on the edges of a lake, but when you're as far from your patch of water as I am, you just can't justify it, or I can't. And I have once gone to the coast and collected my sailboat, brought it to Glendinus, taken it to Rangers Valley Dam and gone sailing out there. But, you know, I was about 18 years old at the time and I didn't ever consider global warming to be anything worth worrying about. Okay. That is worth looking at. Poultry, domestic fowls, living apparently wild, although they may be domesticated pets that have been left here by one of the various grey nomads who habitually camps here. I'm surprised that there are none here. Although today is Saturday. But anyway, yeah. Three trooks at the Arafat Picnic Reserve. And that will have made a bit of a mess. I'll just check that that camera is recording because, you know, paranoid personality disorder. Yes. Wearing sunglasses and can't see the bloody screen of me, as I am. But anyway, that'll make a bit of a mess of the average speed, but it just had to be looked at. Couldn't believe me eyes. 23 k's full power going up this little bit of a hill. Yeah, so that's Yarraford South and Yarraford North. Yeah, so the uh, the juxtaposition between the advent of the death cult of Harvest Everythingism 12,300 years ago at Gobekli Tepe, <coughs> the abandonment of Gobekli Tepe after they created the first agriculture caused desert 
the diaspora from that, the rise of the Amnayans, the conquest of Europe and Eurasia and Asia. And then, after the people of the Middle East had had variously a thousand to six thousand years of harvest everythingism, 25 k's. Right, so he was 75 k's faster than me. That's why it's called playing in the traffic, eh? Yeah, the sudden arise of monotheistic religions which prohibited lending money and charging interest <coughs> in places that had had the longest experience of the death cult of harvest everythingism. And of course, the money lenders, they won. They lent money, people worked their ass off, they competed to trash the local ecology. They dragged everything they collected and harvested and grew and hunted and quote produced, took it to town where somebody with more money bought it as cheap as possible and then sold it among themselves. And when the local ecology collapsed, that's when they went and colonized somewhere else. And to colonize somewhere, you travel a long, long way away from wherever you know how the world works and you shit all over everything you don't understand. The British colonized Australia. They emptied their colon all over 40,000 years of land management, 12,000 years of religion, all designed to maintain the environment for maximum sustainable productivity. So if there was a 10 year drought, nobody starved. And there's now 25 million people in Australia where there used to be one or two million. Here in the Seven Shire, or Glen Innes Seven Shire, there's eight or nine thousand, where there used to be six or seven hundred. So we're overstocked by a factor of 12, and the ecology which used to sustain six or seven hundred people it's been systematically exterminated and fed to the sheep and the cattle and the horses or it's been eroded in the attempt to grow crops and everything that's been produced in excess of what people living here needed to survive on has been shipped away somewhere else to feed someone else All told, it's the most monumental act of bloody vandalism. It is literally enough to give diarrhea the shits. I keep trying to pedal. I keep forgetting that the gears are too short to allow me to do any input. Certainly not up around 30 k's. Just have to wait till the speed washes off. So now we've got uphill into the wind. 
26k, 40% power, basically fighting the computer. However, just at the moment we're breaking through 100 kilometres on the odometer, unless I mistook me math arm, scratch me head Maddox. Twenty three K's eighty per cent power. Twenty three ninety per cent power, but we are down to two bars of battery and we've done fifteen point four Ks. And now we go up the wet driveway. One bar. a bad judgment. Pick the roughest patch of the road to ride on. Seventeen point nine Ks up the hill while I'm having a rest. I don't think that's too bad. Takes kind of real concentration to look fifteen yards in front pick the smooth part and then trust your visual motor cortex hook up to steer the bike onto the smooth bit but it's the only way to do it if you're looking any closer than that you've got no idea where you're going to finish up
the upside down tree with a stone arrow hanging in it. Okay, 103 kilometers, 42 minutes, 43.3, average 23.7. Woohoo! I'll switch you off while I write this down. Yeah, I think that is a lot safer and more functional. May be wrong, but I don't think so. Okay, right, there we go. Mm. 49 minutes overall. Average drop down to 20.5, just pushing it up the hill and going through the gate. 16.9 k's for the ride. 103.2. Okay, you can sit there. This is what's going on here. Thirty six point four volts. Okay, clearly I'm pedaling harder and more because battery number one. After 15.9 was 36, shit, 36.1. Okay. No damage to that, but it's something I won't do again. Yes, that'll teach me. We're in the vernacular. It'll learn me. Right, uh, I think battery tree is over here. Uh, where am I going to learn? That's not how you get that thing open. Switch the cat eyes off. Switch that one off. There we go, battery three. Battery two goes back in the bag. Battery three goes under the arm so it doesn't drop off the bike. And the keys go back. On their handlebar restings. A place for everything and everything in its place. Okay. There we go. I must be getting fitter because I went for further using less electricities. Admittedly, I did not go up the Yarraford Hill, the Yarraford Road Hill twice. Maybe that's the difference. It'll be interesting to see how the recharge from that ride compares with the recharge 
the 15.9 k's along Yarraford Road. The difference between that and that. And that took about three and a half hours to recharge the battery last time. And yeah, I'm going to end this video here. So thanks for coming along while I was playing in the traffic. And presumably you got a sense of the sense of close encounter when a truck goes past. And I'm doing 25 clicks and it's doing 100 clicks. But we did not come to grief. Presumably. We chopped up road signs helped even if a little bit warbles on a lot to youtube ciao